And I just thought, this has never happened before. Like, I've been on this bed many times. Yes. But this has never happened. Hello, listeners. Thank you for joining us for McElhenney's podcast. This evening, we are asking you to join us while we listen to Mary Gill, a breast cancer survivor. Mary will talk us through her journey from discovery until where she is today. So hello everybody, I am here today with um, Mary Gill. Mary is a breast cancer survivor and she has become a friend of us here in McElhoney's and we'll talk about that in a moment. I am Sandra, I'm the host today, I'm the general manager here in McElhoney's. I'm delighted to have you here. Thank you. Um, We're talking about a very important issue today. Obviously we are now, um, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, we specialise in mastectomy or girls get a lot of training around getting customers in who are going through the whole process of breast cancer um, surgery, you know, post breast cancer. So it's really an important month for us. So because it's, it's very interesting, it's very important, our topic today. So first of all, um, Mary, tell us a little bit about you, Mary, who you are and, and that. Well, um, I'm 48 now. Obviously, I was diagnosed when I was 42. Um, I've got a 16-year-old daughter, Erin. She just started college, so that keeps me um, extra busy. And um, I'm over and back, as you know, quite a lot to um, back to home in Donegal because my mum's quite elderly now. And um, so I'm over and back probably every five or six weeks. And I always pop to McElhaney's, have done from ever I left. So yeah, that's me. I'm just like um, full-time mum, still chauffeuring around, <laughs> just joined college. So it's 20 miles to the college um, three times a week. So um, just finding my feet again, yeah. getting back to work and normal life um, after years of just mm-hmm. not being able to concentrate on anything other than hospital visits and appointments and one thing and another. Mm-hmm. So just finding my feet. Mm-hmm. at last finding mary again i Mer- suppose it took me a long time it took yeah. you a long time mary is originally a donegal woman lives in london yeah. Luton. Luton, um, yeah. and my first experience of mary was actually in the store yeah with your mum her mum had a tumble and that's how i got to know yes. you way before you know you were obviously just literally coming out of yes. maybe that period at that time yeah. it was only in later years then we realized what what mary you went through so mary um Basically, looking at you today, now you look amazing. Thank you're you. you're very comfortable. But when I was speaking to you earlier, I could see that vulnerability. That time, yeah, it's obviously been a really tough time you've come through. Health issues is not you're not a stranger to health issues. You were you had lots of operations, you had lots yeah. of surgery, you had lots of um, you know trips to the hospital. But what was September? So it was almost six years. The yeah. day, am I right? Yeah, the twelfth of September was um, it was a Tuesday as well. Uh, I was diagnosed, and that was six years ago. Just Tuesday, yeah. gone. So we're celebrating that, yes, right definitely. now, definitely, because yeah. that's, that's amazing. Yeah, um, that you're sitting here and telling your story, and hopefully you will help a lot of people today. But so I'm going to ask you now, Mary. Tell me, first of all, I think the biggest thing that you're going to tell us now is probably one of the most important things about how you found out. Yeah. that you had breast cancer. So tell the listeners about that. Well, to kind of put it as, um, in a nutshell as best I can, from a very young age, even before I left Ireland, um, so from the age of 14, 15, I was having um, my breast checked because I had lumps and bumps. I had very busy breasts and uh, they were just very lumpy. The um, specialist in Larry Kenny at the time, he kept a very close eye every six months I was seen. And um, he kind of and thrilled it into me that realistically he said, you know, you need to be very careful, family history, make sure when he heard then I was moving to England, because I moved mm-hmm. to England at 19, mm-hmm. make sure you get checked. So over the years in England, to start it all off, I wasn't checked. It was like I went to my GPs and said, obviously I've been checked in Ireland, you know, every six months. And they were like, but you know, we don't do that like that, you're too young. And any time I did check, which, which was very, very rarely, I always would have something new. So there'd be a, a new lump or a new bump, so to mm-hmm. speak. And obviously, every time I would have went to the GP, I 
or would have been a lot of times actually when I've been home in Ireland, um, they would have sent me up to Lairkenny when I'd be home on holidays because I would have gone and maybe felt more comfortable. You know, doctors back home were more like you grew up with them yes. from a child, your family doctor, one thing and another, and got checked out. Again, I was checked out a good few times in England and obviously told was nothing. And then about 18 months before I actually found out I had breast cancer, I'd got um, a new um, lump, so to speak. My GP at that stage like, said, no, actually, I send you up in the two-week emergency list mm -hmm. to um, get that checked up out. So I went up, had the mammogram, seen the specialist and was said, no, everything seems fine. But he delved deep into my family background. Yeah. So at that stage, he was like, you know, does anybody belong to you? And I said, yes, you know, um, I had an aunt that had breast cancer, very young. I believe like she was 38 when she had breast cancer. I said, my daddy um, had uh, prostate cancer and then his other sister had ovarian cancer and then a lot of other cancers in the family. But mm -hmm. he really delved into that and he went, he said, that is very worrying. He said, for three siblings to have them three types of cancer, mm -hmm. they're related to one another, that you know, he said, I would feel that there could be a gene, you know, yes. there's a gene not quite right. And he said, my advice would be to you today, he said, I'm going to give you the forms. He said, I want you to take these forms away and I want you to fill them in. And he said, I think they will put you on the yearly program for having your mammogram done. Mm -hmm. But he said, promise me, he said, if they don't, that you will pay to go yearly. Mm -hmm. and have a mammogram done. Yeah. He said, I can't instill that enough into He said, I just don't like your family history, history mm. and one thing and another. So that was grand. I went away with forms, left them on the to-do pile list. Mm -hmm. Don't know if everybody has that, but I've got a yes. to-do pile. And for 18 months or thereabouts, kept on thinking, I really need to fill in them forms. I need to do it. Mm -hmm. And didn't get around to doing it. So 18 months later, or thereabouts, felt on the forms. Sent the forms back in the February thinking, don't know how long the process is, yeah. but um, within three or four weeks of the forms being returned, got the call to go for the mammogram and have a talk with the, the team that deal with like um, the genetics I suppose, behind, like, what kind of high risk you are. Yes. So, obviously, went in for a chat before the mammogram with the doctor and the nurse. And, um, yeah, they were quite concerned, as their colleague was the 18 months before, mm -hmm. of the family history, and said, we will, we, we will keep a close eye on you now. We will do a mammogram yearly until you're 60. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know... How often do you check the nurse, obviously breast care nurse? And I was like, well, I don't really check because every time I check, my boobs are that bumpy and lumpy. I find something mm -hmm. and it gets you on that. You dread it, you feel panic. sick and you yes. panic and then you go and it's all fine. She is actually the person who saved my life mm -hmm. because she ate me as, and that's putting it mildly and she went, you know, there's no point you coming here and have, yes, we'll do this mam mammogram yearly. But she said, you know the best detector of you're to develop breast cancer. And she started to wave her hands and fingers, mm -hmm. these, and she kept going around and sink circles into my face. Mm -hmm. And she said, I mean it, she said, I want you to check. I want you to start checking, go home tonight. I want you to check and a month and every month from now, she said, I want mm -hmm. you to check your breasts because she said, then you're going to notice anything that's new. Yes. So obviously we've checked you out today. It's good. Mm -hmm. It's a good um, day to start. I said, yeah, all right, I'll go home. Mm -hmm. I'll check. Of course, Mary went home. Mary didn't check. Mm -hmm. And that was the march. And it was quite ironic, really. I always feel it was my dad. I do. I do feel my dad's past. And I always felt my dad because it's quite surreal. Every day or every other day, you know, I would have 
got something telling me you haven't checked yet. You mm -hmm. need to check. And I might be driving, might be doing cooking, whatever yeah, it would some... be, it would come to me. Um, I haven't checked, but it yeah. was like somebody was telling me. Like a little I nudge. Need, it was. Mm. It was a little, little nudge. And just that feeling there that you didn't, and it was like a voice was telling me, you need to check. And didn't, kept on thinking, I'll oh, do it tonight, do it tonight, or do it whenever. And time passed, and in the June, from obviously the March, still hadn't checked. And I was in the shower one morning, and obviously this came to me again. And I thought, right, I'll just do it. Mm -hmm. So I started on my left breast, and as soon as I put my hand on my breast, I was a bit, and I wasn't concerned, because for me up to that point, anything I'd felt before, now they were tiny, like, you know, it might have been little nodulars. Um, they felt like little pea size. Mm -hmm. I'd never actually found anything like this, but it felt quite flat. Mm -hmm. And as we know now, that's, that's the type mine was, but it was very flat, wasn't a lump by any stretch of the word. So I immediately didn't panic. I felt and I thought, well, I know I've got condensed tissue on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. Actually, Larry Kenny had diagnosed me condensed tissue mm -hmm. maybe a couple of years before that and I'm thinking well this is only June had my mammogram in March mm -hmm. the right to you two weeks later um, and I was fine nothing so I wasn't worried about it at all and I don't know what length of time passed it wasn't for the want of being in GPs and hospitals at any point I could have mentioned it still there maybe I best get it checked out still not worried about it felt quite confident it was mm -hmm. nothing. And made the appointment to go and see a GP. My own GP, as it turned out, was on maternity leave. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to see a male GP who usually was very thorough. So I'm going to him, obviously, sit down, explain. I've had this mammogram done in March and they've put me on this special program. So going to be done yearly. But I found this, you know, couple of weeks back. Me even saying it feels a bit like condensed mm -hmm. tissue. tissue, whatever. So obviously he said I'll have to call in the receptionist to examine you. Called in the receptionist, um, got me up on the table, examined me thoroughly. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll never forget he was washing his hand, drying his hands when I thought, what is he actually going to now say to me? You know, mm -hmm. what, what he thinks. So he wasn't going to say anything. And I turned around and I said, um, what do you like? What do you think? And he went, when he said breasts are meant to be lumpy, and that was his exact words. Breasts are meant to be lumpy. I don't think it's anything to worry about. And he said, you said you had that um, mammogram in March. And I went, yeah, I did. Well, he said, I can't see it on, but he didn't go back far enough. Obviously, the, as you can appreciate, I know it was only June, but because my medical of was course. so intense, yes. her man would have been probably there all yes. day trying to go back to March to see. But I said, no, they did write to me and it was clear. And he said, well, he said, go away and wait till you get a period. And he said, check then. And he said, if it's still there after your period finishes, he said, sure, come back. He said, I'll probably then have to send you up. Mm -hmm. But he made it sound in that instant, I'm still lying on the bed at this mm -hmm. stage. And I just thought, you know, you're making me sound as if I'm a pain, as if, you know, I'm a hypochondriac. Like, mm. it was like, you've had it checked in March. There was nothing wrong with you in March. So, because I'd gone into him not concerned, because I was very confident thinking that it wasn't anything sinister, I went away, got into my car, and didn't tell anybody. Mm. So, time passed, two months passed, it was August, and I was just literally, we were ready just to leave, to get into the car, to head to Ireland in the boat because my stepdaughter was getting married. And um, Don Demise voice said, I never checked, but more so, I hadn't had a period. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, haven't I, f I forgot? I literally had forgot. So I thought, right, I'll just do a quick check. Obviously put my hand, like obviously inside my top, but I could still feel it, yes. still there. So I thought, a best ring. So I rang before I left the house and said, obviously, I was told to check when I had a period, mm -hmm. but I didn't get one. It's a couple of months later, but it's still there, so I need to make an appointment. Mm -hmm. At this stage, my own doctor had come back from maternity leave, and 
I said I would like to see her and they were like oh like she's on holidays now for two weeks and I said well that's perfect because I'm going to Ireland for two weeks. So that was grand I went to Ireland never told a soul. I was feeling very um, tired and rough mm -hmm. at this stage but I had been feeling very tired for the couple of years but every time I mentioned it all my specialists and doctors always put it down to what I was going through Sorry. because I was in immense pain all the mm -hmm. time and multiple surgeries yeah. at that stage and horrific um, you look, Your body was doing a lot of healing as my well. My body was doing a lot mm -hmm. of healing. So it all made sense that yes. why you'd be falling asleep, you know, during the day in one mm -hmm. thing and another. But the only thing I can really relate to when we got to Ireland, I got this wild um, craze for fuzzy drinks. I was drinking them like they were going out of fashion and just felt just not myself. Mm. But again, didn't tell anyone. Came back to England, went to obviously my doctor's appointment and obviously when my doctor examined me, she then said, oh no, I'm going to have to send you for a wee ultrasound, but I don't want you to worry. And mm -hmm. I remember, I never will forget, I was like, really? Do you think that's necessary? I was actually going to hospital the next day, for being your, yeah. and I was like, do I, do I have to? And she was like, no, Mary, you do need to get that checked. So that was grand. Off I went, and, then that, and at that time when you got an emergency referral in England, it's a two-week window, but you had a number that you rang obviously mm -hmm. and she said now make sure you ring that like today and I literally forgot to ring it the next day at hospital forgot so that was I think maybe a Tuesday or Wednesday mm -hmm. Friday they didn't even wait they rang me mm -hmm. you haven't rang to book in your slot right and I was like oh, I forgot so they were said, can you come in Tuesday? And I went, yeah, come in Tuesday. The day that I was going to have, um, the, I knew I was having an ultrasound. They then mm -hmm. wrote to me as well, mm -hmm. just say, you know, you're going to have an ultrasound today. And I went out to get into my car and I had a puncture. So I had to be dropped. My friend Mary, another Mary, Mary dropped me. She'd read the letter and she went, you know, you're having an ultrasound today. And I said, no, I know, Mary. She went, do you want me to come in with you? And I went, mm. not at all, like, Mm. I couldn't have possibly, Sandra, at that stage, expected every time I had a hospital appointment, of someone course. come with me. So I was like, don't be so silly. I'm mm. fine. Mm -hmm. So she said, are you sure? And I said, I'm grand, Mary. I go in. I mean, you're looking around and there's a lot of, like, upset people. Yeah, it's not a nice... It's not, it's a, not nice a nice setting. setting it's not a nice setting. Way. Yeah. And then I think fear starts to yes. take over. You're sitting there and you're thinking then, God, I hope I don't get bad news. And then you're thinking, no, I'm not going to get bad news. First doctor called me in then, he examined me, and he said, I think it, it could, you could be right. I think it could be, you know, a bit of condensed mm -hmm. tissue. But he said, because you had the mammogram in March, we'll do, we'll do the ultrasound today. So that was grand. I went out, back out to the waiting list. They got one of their, it was one of the senior surgeons that actually done my ultrasound. Mm -hmm. But I'd met her before because it wasn't my first time. Got into the room, chatting, chatting away and sitting and she went over everything before she got me to lie down. I'm still chat. She started to do the ultrasound and she's chatting away. And when she got to the left breast, she just stopped talking. And it took me, I suppose, seconds, but I just got a really sick feeling. Mm -hmm. It's nearly like a homesick feeling. Like when you leave home, you be there for a while, go back and get homesick. Mm -hmm. I got just a really awful sick feeling in my gut. And I just thought, this has never happened before. Like I've been on this bed many times. Yes. But this has never happened. And I was staring at her. I think she could feel my glaze. Nurse is standing back, mm -hmm. obviously just still obviously smiling at me at this point. I think holding my hand as well. She just looked at me and she said, Mary, I see a shadow. I just went to pieces. Mm -hmm. I can't explain it. Um, it's like, you know when people say you have a near-death experience and your life flashes mm -hmm. in front of you? Erin just was the first thought. Your daughter. I mm -hmm. was like, 
Oh my God, Erin was 10 at the time. Mm -hmm. And Erin, act her actual friend at school, her mommy was going through breast cancer. Aww. So Erin had kind of helped her along the way. And mm -hmm. you know, my first thought initially, you know, I'm going to die. And I was like, how can this be? Just had like a mammogram done in the March, like nothing. Like, has it just come now? Mm -hmm. And she was like, we don't know, but she said mammograms don't pick up all types of cancer. Mm -hmm. But she said, I, I don't know how long it's there. We're going to need to do a biopsy now. So obviously she'd done the biopsy, done two biopsies that day. It was very difficult to do the biopsy. Mm -hmm. um, they really had a punch. Like anybody's had a biopsy will know it's just a little round, mm -hmm. needly looking um, wee instrument, but mm -hmm. they had a really punch it in both times um, to withdraw what they needed. And when she'd done all that, and she was like, Mary, I just don't like what I see. And mm -hmm. I thought, oh my God. Mm -hmm. I, if you're telling me this now before the biopsy, because I said, the bio she said, we'll get the biopsy back by Friday. But she mm -hmm. said, I don't like what I see. She took in her colic, she looked it over, and both were like, no. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, as they describe it, massive, dark area yeah. um, in front of them on the screen. And the shock was, as you can imagine, was immense. Mm -hmm. And I think on their part, what they'd done well, they were like, when they obviously told me, they said, right, who's out, you know, who's in the waiting room, mm -hmm. we'll get them in. And I was like, oh no, I came by myself. And they were like, you came by his... And I was like, well, I have a lot of hospital appointments. Yeah. You can't expect someone to come. So they very much were like, well, you're, we're not letting you leave here. You need mm -hmm. to ring someone. And so that was all very mm -hmm. good, I think, for to make sure I wasn't going to go home, mm -hmm. maybe, and not tell mm -hmm. anyone. And they handled it. They handled it. They handled it very well. That's really traumatic, and that's going to trigger a lot of people listening today because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people that had a very similar experience. And thank you for, for going into so much detail there, Mary, because I know that's triggering for you and, and it's a very traumatic time for you. Um, but there's a few points there that I want to pull out on, starting from the beginning was, one was we rely, we think once we have our mammogram, we're okay. Um, so many of us probably think already for a mammogram, I'm not going to check now for a couple of months. So you become into, relying on this, the experts in the science. And in that case, that's not the case. The other thing is the importance and that, you said that that um, nurse was really cross with you that day. 100%, the importance yeah. of self-checking. There's four of us in this room today and not one of us. I would randomly check. I am very like, you have very lumpy breath. It's almost like you're like, there's no point. I'm only going to find mass tissue which is every time you go and get a check that has been really st a strong message for, for me yeah. and for us today is the importance of self-checking um, and the other thing that I think is really important is when we're checking we're always checking for this little round lump yeah um, I know from working in here and working and having breast cancer nurses and that into the store we have the prosthesis down there with the different forms of breast yes. cancer and there's one or two that has a lump, but what you had was what is, it's it's flat. And it's, it's flat. like, you explained yeah. it, and I think it's really important that the listeners hear this. It's like the bark of a tree. Yeah, that's the way my um, oncologist and surgeon then explained it to me. It grows like a bark root of a tree. So it glows flat. It's not very easy to detect. And that's why when we're checking our breasts, we need to really like dig Get in. Right there's in. no point just doing a, we need to, Really, really, it's it's um, getting the flat of your hand it's down, flat of your hand, pushing really, fl and yeah. feeling. And as they said, in my case, I was very lucky. I did find it mm -hmm. because it's usually harder to detect. Mm -hmm. Mammograms sometimes don't pick it up, which in my case it, it didn't. And only mine was sitting very close to my skin. Yes, as they think how I found it, found it. myself. I think it is so important, and I think that's what breast cancer month is really good at you know there's lots of different locations throughout the whole country 
that has, if you get it somewhere that you know local to you, that goes as a, and there's a breast cancer nurse, so we'll go and make the visit, go and talk to them because we, I, anything I learned with breast cancer was the, those awareness days in here. Yeah. So tell us about, you know, you get your diagnosis from that journey to the surgery. Yeah. How quick was that? Well, I was diagnosed on the 12th of September and I was obviously under um, the NHS. And so for the first three or four weeks, and I had an MRI, and ironically, the MRI didn't pick up my cancer either, which is extremely unusual. And I went, a friend that had had, had breast cancer contacted me one night, and the poor girl spent an hour and a half on the phone, and the only way I can describe it, taking me off the ceiling, peeling mm -hmm. me off it, because she said, please, Mary, go for second opinion. And I was like, no, I've got lovely, like, you're assigned a Macmillan nurse. Yeah. Um, I really loved the female surgeant, kind of had a rapport nice with her. Nice bond there, yeah. Nice bond. I want to stick there. They'd, they'd done the bracket testing for me mm -hmm. and one thing and another, and I want to stick there. And she was like, please, she said, go and have second opinion. And she gave me the details of who she used. So in the back of my head, from the minute I knew I had cancer um, from that Tuesday, in my own mind, I wanted my breasts both off. Mm -hmm. There was no doubt in my mind I wanted them Gone. both off. Because yeah. I thought, I'm 42, um, I've got a 10 year old, if I do get reoccurrence, you know, it's never mm -hmm. good. I know I could still get reoccurrence, touch wood, um, I don't, but mm -hmm. um, I wanted them off. And it's a personal choice there again. I don't feel I would have handled keeping one and not having another one and checking. Um, I was never great at checking as it was. Yes. I was frightened. I would have been petrified. Yes. And so I went to see um, the specialist on her recommendation. Just as it turned out, the panel we're four or five weeks in, nearly at this stage, the panel were having a discussion that day on moving forward, what would be the next plan for me. We knew it was going to be surgery, but we didn't know what that would entail. And the surgeon I went to see, he then informed me that my MRI didn't pick up my cancer, which mm -hmm. I asked, was that unusual? And he said, extremely unusual. So he said, with that in mind, he said, if I can't trust the equipment, I can't keep an eye on you. So he said, I would recommend you to have both breasts mm -hmm. removed. So at that point, I said, well, that's what I wanted. Mm -hmm. Anyways, and obviously rang the hospital that evening when I got home from him. The nurse had said that we just had the meeting earlier today and we've decided that we will only take off one breast, which is the left breast, which mm -hmm. has had the cancer in it. She said, there's no cancer showing on the right and she said, we don't do preventative, we only do, obviously, life-saving mm -hmm. surgeries. So at that point, I said, well, I've then, that's made my decision. Mm -hmm. I want the both off. Mm -hmm. And obviously, Mr. Davison has said that that's what he would highly yes. recommend. So at that point then, the ball did start for not really moving very quickly. Like, as I say, I had an MRI, had been for the BRCA genes and the bloods and stuff. But I'd seen him on like a Thursday and he said, if you go with me, I want you in tomorrow and want to do a whole um, bone to see is there any secondaries. Mm -hmm. So obviously you go in, you're, you're radioactive for quite a little while, you have to sit in the room by yourself. That was really scary. Mm -hmm. I was petrified and obviously I just, I felt like I was waiting on death row. Yeah. I think that's the only way I could... I could describe it. Had that done, he rang me the next day. He said he didn't want me waiting. Thankfully, I was all clear. There was no um, secondaries. I just fell to the ground. Just relief mm -hmm. at that point that I was not having any secondaries, mm -hmm. or secondaries, rather. So um, at that point, he said, right, I want you on Monday, and we're going to like um, remove lump nodes. We'll check there's no spread to lump nodes. And then had that done on the Monday, as I said to you, it's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. um, they inject um, blue dye in through your nipple 
um, they have you on a machine while they're doing that to make sure that the dye goes to the right places of the lump nodes and then they take you to theatre and I think it must turn everything luminous and then they removed two of my lump nodes but thankfully I had no spread to my lump mm -hmm. nodes and yeah must have been a few days of, of weighing blue. <laughs> yes. I was like um, mm -hmm. I was smurfed out of it mm -hmm. and obviously my, my nipple was permanently blue and that never mm -hmm. went away actually onto the obviously took them away mm -hmm. so um, I went that was that Monday then had that that was grand no spread there which was all tick 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 everything was going in the right direction and he said I'll take you in the following week and we'll obviously do double mastectomy so went in um, had obviously the double mastectomy mm -hmm. and the most horrible part well the most horrible part for me was the drains they were dreadful, like four of them. So you're walking around with four milk bottles, is what the nurses call them, and they look like milk, bo mm. milk bottles. And obviously they're to drain everything away. They're very painful being removed. And I was kept in for over a week because while I was in there, I started to have problems. With What's my, your original? With yeah. my original mesh problem. So they kept me longer. So I was in over a week, got home. And then obviously the next week I was to get my my stitches out and that was the only thing was worrying me was getting mm -hmm. the stitches out as I said to you so went to that point then to get the stitches out and wasn't even worried about what the biopsy was going to say mm -hmm. but obviously when they originally had seen the cancer on the ultrasound they had said that they believed it to be 19 millimeters mm -hmm. and that's what they were working for but obviously in my case they only had the ultrasound they didn't have the um, all right to back it up because didn't see it mm. so when they obviously sent it to the lab and the lab done whatever they did it turned out to be 59 millimeters which was a massive that I think nearly finished me off because uh. up to that point I was very upbeat I was very mm -hmm. positive and you just go you go through the motions you've you, you it's kind of like being on everybody as I'm sure that you've ever heard talk about cancer it's mm -hmm. like a roller coaster yes it is you're on that roller coaster and you can't get off mm -hmm. you know I felt it too it's like blinkers on a horse I only could look straight in front of me mm -hmm. I couldn't go side to side like yes you had to go through that door mm -hmm. you you couldn't back out even if you wanted to so mm -hmm. you're you're very much carried on a wave yeah and one thing and after another that was my breaking point mm -hmm. I didn't deal with that no very well as I said to you, I up to that point, you know, I had loads of visitors, I had loads of phone calls. And when I got that news, because I got that news on the Thursday and he said, I want you in on the Monday. Because Monday was the only day he he done theatre. Mm. And we're going to have to remove the skin that was left because it was so close to your skin. We think it might have spread to your skin. So that was from that Thursday to that Monday, I was just like an absolute... Mm -hmm. um, Nervous wreck, yeah. And you know, my sister and my mum off a job. Um, mm -hmm. Raymond, my husband, had took Erin away mm -hmm. um, for the week. I urged him to take her away for a few days. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, it's all meant to be because I, at that point, I was so strong for Erin, yes. And I didn't, she wouldn't, I didn't want her seeing me like that. Like, I, I just was yeah. that low, I couldn't have kept up beat. Mm -hmm. I was just crying my eyes out, I was unconsolable. And then went into my shed. I didn't want to see anyone. No. As I said to you earlier, um, my sister-in-law and her husband landed, and my uncle's girlfriend landed, mm. and I had to tell my sister to send them away. Mm -hmm. like, I couldn't. I and I felt terrible. As I said yeah. to you, because that was never me. I'm very chatty. Yeah. Love to see people. Love to have people. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just couldn't. I just couldn't deal with it. We, we, we did talk about that earlier, Mary, and you were saying that everybody had a. The low, I'm yeah. sure everybody will remember that lowest point yeah. and I think it's something that when someone unless you're going through it it probably like something like that hit you whereas a different peer, different part of that process yeah. you know there's no size fits all I suppose no, when not. it comes to no. any form of cancer and yes. the, the, the process of getting through it um, and you know I think that you said there from a very sociable person you know that we I suppose we, there's there needs to be an understanding around 
there's going to be those moments for those loved ones who want to reach out and help. And we've been, I've, I'm sure we've all been there yeah. where you want, all you want to do is hug them and hold them and they don't want you near them. And I think yeah. that's a very, you know, it's probably, it's very, it's probably a confusing time yeah. for someone that is from the outside when they just want to help. But when you're going through this, as you said, you'd blinkers on, you're just looking yeah. forward and you just have to just literally get through this and survive. So, I mean, that was something that really resonated with me with what you said, because I've been there and yeah. not that long ago with someone very close to me and you want, all you want to do is help, but they don't want, they don't want it. Mm. Um, and I mean, that's a, a really, really strong story. What you've said there, that as you said, those highs, those lows, yeah. thinking you're right, this surgery is going to be the, all I need. I'm going to get through this and then I can get move on and then finding out that it was much more deeper than you thought and then the additional surgery that was needed just to get it away yeah and then the hope of you you obviously wanted reconstruction and Did. you explained that they leave a fold of skin yes. in order to refill and then yeah a lot of people when they have double mastectomies surgeons will do reconstruction there and then but because of my past history I've been very, very ill, as I said to you, after yeah. my mesh surgery. I got um, collapsed lung and pneumonia, and he just felt... My, my surgery was going to be over six hours, as it was, and he just felt if he was to do my reconstruction on the day, that it'd be like 11 and a half hours, and he just didn't think he was want me to do it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, if you don't think I'm going to do it, I'm not going to do it. So it was all meant to be... Because mm -hmm. when he then told me about the 19, of, from the 19 to the 59, he did say to me when he took me in then that Monday to go off the skin, he come round that morning and he went, you know, Mary, you were very lucky that you decide, because they do leave it up, they, they guide you, but then the choice is all, yes. all yours, yes. so to speak. And he said, you were very lucky that you actually didn't go ahead with the reconstruction. Because he said, it would have been very difficult for me to get in today. So at that point, he said, I now have to, you have to lose the skin on the left that was left. Mm -hmm. As I said, they pull it up. It's just like a little envelope flap. Mm -hmm. We have to take all that away. Mm -hmm. And he said, you are looking at radiation now. Mm -hmm. And reconstruction will be very difficult. Mm -hmm. We're not even sure if it is possible. Mm -hmm. It'll all depend down at that at that stage was mm -hmm. a way down the road, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that was the worst point. Then the worry, and then he come to me as soon as I woke up. As I explained to you, it's unbelievable. The strong your your mind is a very small strong um, and identity of mm. you because. I'd had so many surgeries and usually would go out like a light mm. and in this case couldn't get me to go to sleep and mm -hmm. in the end up it took a lot of gas mm -hmm. to get me to go to sleep. I just kept, I just didn't want to go to sleep because for me I panicked. I didn't want to go to sleep because I didn't want to wake up to be told yes. what I thought and they thought I was going to be told because yes. I thought, I said all along from the start that if it wasn't terminal, mm -hmm. that throw whatever you like at me and mm -hmm. I'm going to take a chin on. Yeah. And that's all I wanted because obviously at the start you don't know what you're dealing with mm -hmm. and that wit between the Tuesday to Friday you find out you're not terminal and it's treatable. Yes. But at that stage when you don't know, you're just, you're just planning mm -hmm. your death really because it's, you just think you're going to die. Mm -hmm. It's just that fear. And for me, I promised, and I, I, say, I made a promise that if, if I wasn't terminal, that throw whatever you like at me and I'll deal with it. Yes. And for me, I was like, if it spread to my skin, that's it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that would have been it. Yes. But in my head, I had built it up that it would be. So obviously, luckily, when I came round, he, he came to me pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, like, I don't know 100% because I have to now send it off to the lab. So it's another waiting game for another mm -hmm. 10 days. But he said, for what I can see mm -hmm. underneath the scope and what we've took away, 
I can't see anything. Mm -hmm. So obviously you wait them 10 days, it'll be the longest 10 days mm -hmm. of your life. And thankfully, thank God, I, it didn't, it wasn't spread. Yeah. So I God. started then my radiation journey then. Yeah. And I mean, it's you're so brave. It's just incredibly the way you're sitting there talking about this is just so, you know, it's you're so brave, Mary. And, you know, uh, it's we're, I'm sitting here and I feel I almost feel selfish because 100%. you've had to go through this and, you know, no one could ever understand. Nobody could ever understand unless you've been through it. And many of our listeners will have been there. Um, and I mean, we could talk to you all day about yeah. this and there's never enough information that you could give us. But I suppose um, what has got to here, I suppose, and get you sitting here today was yeah. your experience then at McElhenney's because yes. a lot of people don't know this, but you, if in the Republic of Ireland, you are entitled to, if you're um, part of the health service, you're entitled to two free mastectomy bras. Yeah. And that information is given probably at a time when they probably won't even remember it. Yes. Because all those things you've talked about, somewhere in the middle of that information probably was given. So a lot of the a lot of people out there don't know that, right? So um those two for the that's where our services come in here is we have a team of experts that's trained in, yes. especially by the laundry companies that, that specialise in mastectomy. And they go to Germany for the training yeah. and it's it's full on and they do a lot of psychology and like from what you've said there yeah. it's a really they love it but it's yeah. a it takes a certain kind of person yeah so you came here so tell us about that I did because I was always coming as you know I'm a big fan of Michael Henley's always have been but I when you're in the hospital you have your surgery the nurse does come around and give you um, a couple of bras and you get your cushion and fills because that stage you can't wear anything heavy and you go away and they give you loads of leaflets probably like as you just mentioned now and there was an array of things in them leaflets um, for me to go to England I just didn't feel comfortable doing that I just felt it was personal and I was like coming home then when I could as soon as I could come home I was like to mum and my sister I'm gonna have to Michael Hannes because mm -hmm. I always felt very at home in Michael Hannes yeah. and over the years, I always would have bought a lot of brass mm -hmm. and obviously knew the girls really well mm -hmm. and would always have always had my measuring done mm -hmm. here and one thing and another. And I just came up to the girls, obviously, had already known them anyways, but the warmth, you wouldn't have to know them. Mm -hmm. They're just so lovely. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just so caring, understanding and just, it was just, it was a treat because it's something you dread because I know not everybody loves their boobs, but mm -hmm. I did. Mm -hmm. So I had amazing boobs. Mm -hmm. I was an F. I used to get stopped all the time and asked, were they real? Mm -hmm. And I loved them. Mm -hmm. So although I never, I never grieved losing them because obviously they tried to kill me. Mm -hmm. But for me, I thought my boobs are gone. I'm not really interested and you know I'll just carry on with these shabby yes bras and not bother so I was like go to Michael Hannes and just the experience like there's so as I say to you I'm wearing one of them today yeah one of your post that, yeah one of my post mm. ones it's beautiful as you can see it's grey and feminine, pink it's yeah. very feminine and it was just so lovely that I ended up buying I uh, maybe four or five bras that mm -hmm. day because they were just so nice and I'm mm. looking at them thinking they're actually really nice and I felt really good in them and just, you know, it's very intimate. You go in the room here and the girls are just so understanding mm -hmm. and just very natural. Like I could have been standing in just with me and my sister. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It was it felt very comfortable yeah. and normal. And they're very sincere. Mm -hmm. Like they, they have so much empathy. Yeah. Which is you know, and it's always not easy for them. No. You know, because you could be dealing with someone's getting very upset. Mm -hmm. It's a very traumatic thing. 
Um, but they they are absolutely brilliant. It's very specialist, I suppose. And when we do send them for these trainings, you have to think of the person because it does, as you say there, it takes a certain amount of strength and tact. And you need to be, you're probably at your most vulnerable at every point in your life. Yeah. Probably stripping down your husband, people close to you may have seen. Yeah. But this is, in most cases, a stranger that's going to see you yeah. And you're, 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 I suppose, your most vulnerable form that you've ever been in your you life. Don't feel, you don't feel like a woman no. anymore. You know, you, you, you certainly definitely don't feel sexy. You don't feel like a woman. You just, yes. it's just not nice, you know? I, I, and I know the girls, we would talk about it a lot. And I mean, this, we're in a busy department store, but these girls are doing something so unique yeah, and yeah. so special in the midst, amidst the, the chaos of a day and they change so many lives. We get so many complimentary yeah. letters about them. And, yeah. But it is something that over the years now that, you know, obviously with the five of five, now I, I've got a lot of survivors on there yeah. and it's something that I am really, really want to grow more is yeah. this awareness of this because you may you may just want a nice bra. And as I say, you mentioned it there a couple of times. Mary, I'm sure you want to feel, we're still women, oh, you want 100%. to feel yeah. feminine, you want to feel sexy, and you know, you've come through the fight of your life, you're out the other side, so it is something we're constantly seeking out, is finding the, yeah. the right product for survivors or people going through that, and we have some, we have had ladies, people in here as young as 18, 19, that have gone yeah. through that, and I mean, I the trauma around that yeah for that person is terrific so that's why today i think it's so important that the that you know there's probably a lot of people out there that don't know that even you know whether they're northern ireland that it's just yeah. finding a nice feminine bra 100 percent, and it becomes something nice to do yes. it's actually i come away feeling really of a high yeah i left with my beautiful bras that I didn't think going, I thought I was going to get, yeah. you know, something that was going to be horrible yeah. and dirty and not... And surgical, I suppose. And you, surgical. But you didn't want to trigger, you want something to remind you of you, yeah. uh, Mary. Yeah. Mary, in terms of, for you who've come through it, for someone that may be out there that has just had that news, as you say, no size fits all, but... No. For, for advice from someone that they're like no one everybody's probably giving them advice and very few people understand but yeah. what would be your biggest piece of advice for anyone right now going through or just had that news i think the first thing for me comes to mind it's okay not to be okay mm -hmm. um because it's such like a roller coaster ride and there's all sorts of emotions go through your head you know Lack of sleep, I didn't sleep. I think the first nine weeks I didn't sleep a wink. Um, just look after you. You're, as my Nifa just told me when I went in feeling so bad about I turned people away the night before. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, that's okay. Mm -hmm. That was the right thing to do. You need to just think about you. Mm -hmm. And I think as women, we're not, we find it hard to be selfish. Mm -hmm. And I think I had a few nurses told me that on my journey. We need to be a bit selfish. So I think it's okay not to be okay. And people will around you will adjust and they'll understand. You know, not everybody wants to talk about it. And it's okay. Whatever emotion you feel, if you do feel like reaching out, mm -hmm. um, as I say, I'm always be more than happy to talk to anyone. Mm -hmm. It is a very lonely road. You could have... 20 people around you and you still feel mm -hmm. quite alone. No one can understand the emotions that you're going through and just take it step by step. I always say now, have the slice of cake, buy the shoes, mm -hmm. just love for today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And every emotion you feel is okay. If that's how you are on that day, mm -hmm. That's okay. And I think there you said, let the people around you adjust. Yeah. Take the lead from you. Yes. You know, I think as Irish people, it's our immediate reaction to get in there, help, cook, bake. What yeah. can I do? What can I do? What can I do? When really all you need is yeah. a little bit of peace. So yeah, that's, that's good sound advice. And I think for me, Mary, you know, the biggest, the, 
the biggest message for anybody out there listening to today is look at you now. You're sitting here six months, yeah. six years post. Yeah. Strong, yeah. healthy. You're glowing. The health yeah. is back and the vitality is yeah. back in your body. And you've survived it and you're giving yeah. advice to people. And I'm sure at those lowest moments you never thought that was going to be. No, I didn't. I couldn't even imagine the day that I would start, I'd have reached my five years, you know, but I finally, I'd say in the last six, seven months, I feel back to myself. Yeah. I feel I'm merry again. Because yeah. that's the other thing. You will lose yourself. Mm -hmm. You you just lose. You're not you. You're you're there, but you actually feel you're invisible. I finally mm -hmm. can say I'm back to me. That's amazing. Yeah. And I hope people get encouragement. I hope so that. too. Um, listen, on behalf of us here in the room with you, and the entire McElhenney's team. And anybody listen, thank you so, so much, Mary. One, for coming and openly telling your story that is going to trigger, it's going to bring back memories of you and your, as you say, the biggest fight of your life, but you will help so many people today. Um, and one of the takeaways, I think, from me listening to you would be, hands on, get those hands on those breasts and check. For you, what would be yeah. the biggest I was going to say that would be me. I was going to say, obviously, thank you so much for having me. As always, I feel very loved and very at home here in McElhenney's. And it was an absolute pleasure to be asked to do this. And anything I can do to help, I'm always going to be available. But what I would say, not meaning to scare anybody out there. It's not about scaring people. It's about making people aware. Check. Put that reminder in your diary or your mobile phone once a month check mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be a lump get it checked and even then when you get it checked if in the same situation as myself mm -hmm. get that second opinion mary thank you so so much and thank you to all our listeners for listening and um i'm sure that a lot of those things that you've spoke today are going to sit with us and you know i know it's certain you're going to change lives today so thank you thank you so Sandra. so much Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you or anyone that you know has been affected by anything that we have discussed on tonight's podcast, we ask that you reach out to your medical professional who will put you in contact with an expert in that field.